chair is not for Elijah. It's not for Melech HaMashiach, King Messiah. It's for me. Because I don't know about you, but I'm tired. No one else here is tired? Little, little, uh, worn out? Feels like maybe the last uh, year, maybe the last two years, last ten years. Little exhausting, just a bit. Maybe it's okay. You can confess this is Yom Kippur. <laughs> it's okay. I'm not going to criticize you for saying you're tired. In fact, if you didn't say you were tired, I would think there was something wrong with you. If you said, no, no, I'm feeling fine, I'd say maybe this person hasn't been paying attention too much. Maybe they've uh, been a little isolated from the stress of the world. And there is a lot of stress, and I know that it's almost embarrassing to say that. We're not living in some far-flung part of the world that is still struggling to bring running water to everyone. We're not living someplace where people have no food security. Most of us who are here live in the grand scheme of all of human history a relatively comfortable life, give or take the air conditioning on a particularly warm day. But it's still okay to say you're tired because you are stressed. And stress doesn't care about how comfortable you are because that's not the way that we're made. That's not the way that God designed human beings. God didn't design us to be like a lion where we could smack on an ice gazelle and then sit under the tree with a full belly and nap until it was time to get up and have another gazelle. That's not the way God made us. God made us so that when we had a full belly, we worried about where the next full belly would come from. And we'd work to make sure that there would be another full belly, which is why we ended up taking and domesticating animals so that we wouldn't have to go hopefully find one in the middle of the savannah. They'd be right in the back in the fence. And then we could take one when we needed it and eat it and that'd be fine, or milk it or get its eggs. And and then we'd only have to stress about someone taking it from us, so we'd build a wall around the settlement. Or we'd stress about the water, so we'd dig cisterns to gather. And that was one of the things that was a source of happiness in the ancient world. Because when we were stressed, we could do something about it. Not sure if there's going to be enough water? Dig a well. Not sure there will be enough crops? Plant more. Not sure that you're safe enough? Build a higher wall. It was fairly straightforward. Stressed about losing your job? You can't get a gazelle to fix that. You can't dig a well to make that stress go away. Stressed about COVID? Sure, there's lots that we can do and lots that we have done. But does it make the stress go away? No. And stress is exhausting when it has no ready solution. Stress, when we cannot do something direct and concrete, tangible, to resolve the issue that is causing us anxiety, it's like running a marathon without knowing where the end is. The great irony is, is that some people run marathons to relax. And this is something that took me a long time to, to wrap my head around. I look around, I see a few people here, the, the runner types, who actually think running out and pounding the pavement is somehow a relaxing way to spend a few hours of your life. But I finally understood that it was because people that run a marathon are not running a marathon so that they can stay in peak physical per uh, perfection in order to hunt down that gazelle. They are running it not just to cross the finish line, although I'm sure that feels good, not an experience I have ever had. They are running it because in the process of running, they know there is something deeper than just that momentary accomplishment. People will spend their life mastering an instrument, learning the craft of painting or sculpting, working on poems or novels, hours after hours of work. Why? Isn't that exhausting? 
Isn't that every bit as tiring as the stress that we have felt over this last year and a half, two years, ten, longer depending upon your life? Of course not. Because there is something magical that comes from choosing to exert ourselves in a noble endeavor, regardless of the sweat, the pain, the tears that may come in that process. We recognize that when we choose to pick up the running shoes, choose to pick up the, the paintbrush, the pen, whatever it may be that is a long-term endeavor, not just a tweet, not a doodle, not a quick jog around the block, but something that we know we have to commit ourselves to for more than just 30 seconds. There is a special quality that comes from that quantity of time and devotion, of absorption, of focus and dedication. And this too is something that God chose to build into us as a human being to trigger within us an emotion, a rush, a feeling of meaning and purpose when we dedicate ourselves to something willingly that exhausts us and we know that enriches our lives and the lives of others around us. And then we're not so tired. We're not so exhausted. It's true that the stresses, those are still there. Jog 20 miles, and whatever you are running away from and whatever you are running towards, they're not going to change. But in the process of running, you are a person that transcends them. Work on a poem, work on your novel, paint in the backyard, who cares how good you are? Allow yourself to be captivated for hours by a movie, by a play, by radio. Suddenly, you see the world from a different point of view. Suddenly you recognize that active conflict with the challenge is not the only way that we release the tension of stress. Even our ancestors who could build a wall or gather the domesticated animals or dig a well to fight their anxieties, they knew that that wasn't the only way to fight their anxiety. They would spend hours, hours singing together, singing songs around their community sharing the stories of their lives, the stories of their people, working together on monumental projects of communal good that had no practical import. Think of the people who built Stonehenge. Do you think they built that because it helped them gather more firewood? Because it helped them get more sheep? No. That's not why they built it. They built it because there is something yearning in the human spirit to devote ourselves to, and to be exhausted in the process. We're Jews. We know from stress. We know from anxiety. It's become so cliche as to almost be offensive. But we also know from catharsis. And we know from dedication. And we know what it is to absorb ourselves and to come out the other side of that absorption new and different and stronger. And the day that we do that most, Yom Kippur. The day that should be, at the end of the harvest season, the time for relaxing, the time for putting our feet up after a back-breaking summer, is the day that we take to our feet and stand for hours on end, exhausting ourselves more with a fast, Refraining from food, refraining from drink, refraining from other pleasures as well that might provide some comfort. Are we crazy? A little, but not in that way. Because in this absorption over the next 26 hours, in this absorption we release the human spirit in a way that we can't on any other day of the year. I know it's tempting. Believe me, there were times in my life when I gave in to the temptation to do Yom Kippur light. Right? Come for Kol Nidre, tune in. Hi, guys. And tomorrow morning, you know, come back around 10, 30, 11, when the good stuff's happening. Stay for the Torah service. Here for Yisker, absolutely. Maybe the rabbi's sermon. 
But then, you know, it's already past noon. I'll go home, I'll take a nap, and then I'll come back for Ne'ilah. Not Mincha, Ne'ilah, a little bit later, a little bit later. A chance to come back, be with the community, stand before the ark this year, get our goodie bag to go home for your breakfast. But this way I'll have energy for Ne'ilah, we tell ourselves. If I get up too early tomorrow, if I stay too long, how will I have the stamina to go on? You will have more stamina if you stay than if you leave. You will rise to the occasion. And I don't just mean physically for hours on end, although you'll do that too. I mean you will rise spiritually and you will find strength within you that you don't know you have for something like this. Yom Kippur demands something of us because it knows that when we rise to meet that demand, we become better. And we prove to ourselves that we can be better. And that's God's great trick. To give us what looks like an insurmountable task. Keep all of the commandments. And when we try, we find that we can get pretty close. Not perfect. That's why we have Yom Kippur in the first place. But we can do pretty well. But if you think to yourself, there's no way I can keep those commandments. Guess what? Self-fulfilling prophecy. You will fall far short in not only God's eyes, but in your own. And you will disappoint yourself. And God is more forgiving of us than we are of ourselves. The marathon runners, the painters, the novelists, the people who spend hours in their garden, the ones you sow, the ones who do things that require time, investing of themselves for hours, they will tell you the secret of Yom Kippur, that you unleash something in yourself when you allow the exhaustion, the tiredness, the effort to wear down your barriers that are keeping you from recognizing who you truly are, that you are somebody amazing, that you are somebody incredible, that you are one of the lucky few that were chosen to live, chosen to be alive at this most miraculous time in our history, chosen to be Jewish. But it's easy to hide from that. If you have all of your wits about you, if you're still well rested, then you can keep up the illusions that you've had that prevent you from realizing how magnificent you are for the rest of the year. On Yom Kippur, give in to the exhaustion. Give in to your tiredness. Give in to it and you will find that it melts away like the hunger pangs of the fast. And the more you give in to it, the less you feel them blocking you. The more you allow yourself to pour yourself into this service into this day, into its emotions, its moods, the roller coaster of feelings, the more you will experience the high that comes tomorrow night. There's no way to cut the line, no fast pass, no secret, no pamphlet, no quick and easy way. But thank God there isn't. Because there wouldn't be worth it if there were. This Yom Kippur, allow yourself Find that strength. Be here, whether it be physically or whether it be through the live stream with the book in your lap or on your computer screen, whatever way. Unleash the power that God has given you. But you'll have to play your part. Cantor Levy and I will play ours, but we cannot drag you across that marathon finish line. You've got to run that race. Gemar Khatima Tova.